Good morning, everyone, or uh, depending on where you are, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining us for the second day of the QOFEM workshop. Uh, if you have not been uh, with us for the, for the whole workshop, so you missed the first day, I encourage you to uh, view the video because uh, Frank McKenna showed uh, quite a few interesting things about the Sim Center and about QOFEM already that I am going to recap really briefly, but I think you would benefit from taking a look if you could not join us yesterday. So we will start with this recap, and then today uh, I'm going to spend about half of the time with uh, explaining how QOFM can work with Python scripts uh, and OpenCSpy or other custom scripts. And then the second half will be about calibration uh, examples. We will look at conventional calibration that we can also call optimization or minimization uh, problems, and then uh, also look at Bayesian calibration capabilities that are uh, already available in QOFM. So let's start with, the, with this recap that I mentioned. Frank spent some time yesterday introducing the Sim Center. Now I would like to give you this one sentence summary here. So we at the Sim Center are developing open source and extensible tools for researchers in natural hazards engineering by reviewing what is available, tools and software and scripts and then usually providing a preprocessor and a postprocessor to those scripts to create this kind of a puzzle piece, if you want, that we can plug into the framework that we are building for natural hazards engineering workflows. So this allows us to bring in tools from many researchers and then make them work together, which we believe is a unique uh, opportunity that has a lot of potential for our field. Another advantage that we have is uh, we can provide HPC resources or we can relay HPC resources to, to the researchers uh, by having Design Safe as one of the other projects in the NERI uh, initiative. And all of you can run your models uh, and problems at high performance computing clusters for no extra charge. I think this is this is a really good opportunity again for for natural hazards engineers. So that's that's about Sim Center. If you would like to know more, I encourage you to look at the video from yesterday. As far as QoFem goes, this is a one of our tools or applications that we develop. It's a desktop application, as you will see, and as you have seen yesterday, and it combines finite element applications or environments with uncertainty quantification and optimization. So it provides you uh, the, the tools uh, you need to perform uncertainty quantification on uh, finite element models, typically open seas models that you already have, without the need to, to learn and develop those codes that are required to do uncertainty quantification and optimization. Currently, QOFEM uh, makes use of the Dakota uh, engine which is developed by sandia labs and it's a robust uncertainty quantification framework that's uh since basically 2018 but also 2019 and i have these other uq libraries and tools there for 2020 to, to show you that we are expanding beyond dakota we recognize that there are certain things that are not available in dakota and some of the researchers might require those types of uh, methods. So we will make them available, but we would like to hear from you and learn which direction you would like us to take. So what types of uncertainty quantification problems are you interested in solving? If we know what you are interested in, we can much easier fulfill those needs in the future. This is a list of links. Uh, if you download this uh, presentation, the slides from Design Safe. You can, uh, just to make it easier for you to access the setup guide and the online documentation and the message board, all of these were also mentioned uh, in more detail yesterday. I would like to specifically highlight that uh, one of the people from yesterday, Andre Barbosa, already did a really great job and we are very grateful for him for, for providing a couple of feature requests at the message board and I encourage others to do the same. This is how we can learn what you are interested in. So 
Thank you, Andre. And uh, I also wanted to flash the documentation page that we have. This is just one of the uh, pages there that describes the example that I'm going to look at today and that was also uh, discussed by Frank yesterday. So if you need to know more or if you are interested in how the tool works, this documentation shall provide you enough information to, to use the tool. And if you find some deficiencies or problems or areas which you think are not covered, again, please go to the message board and let us know. So a high level overview of the tool uh, is provided by this slide. You can see that there are uh, a couple of, it, it's, it's broken up into a couple of areas. The input panel section is where you navigate uh, as you provide certain types of inputs from the top to the bottom. And then the results are shown in the last step. For each uh, step, you have a different uh, input panel, which asks for different types of uh, input uh, values. And uh, then you can run the analysis using the run button. We will talk about the design safe options later today uh, in the presentation. And there is this login button that is also related to that. And the message area is where you can get some uh, error messages or confirmation that the analysis is running. So this is where you should pay attention to if you are actually running the analysis. All right, so that was the recap part. Now let's jump into the Python scripts and how to use them and what opportunities you have when you use Python in uh, Quofen. We looked at this tickle-based uh, uh, example yesterday with Frank. Maybe you remember that there was this uh, frame structure that uh, was modeled in the tickle file. And today I'm going to show you how you can do the same uh, example using Python scripts and then what advantages you have when you do so. All of the examples that I'm showing today are also available at the Design Safe uh, repository where you have downloaded the QoFem executable from and also where you have the slides available. So if you download that zip file, uh, you can always know which example we are looking at by looking at the bottom right uh, corner of the slide. So this is O1 OpenSys by Basic, for example. And then this is the file name that, uh, uh, this is the name of the file that I have opened. All right, so I think it's uh, quite easy to see that uh, from the tickle file, we arrive at a, a Python file using OpenSys Pi. Basically, it's a one-to-one -to -one, uh, transformation. Uh, there, is, there are a couple of uh, interesting parts of this file that I will cover in the, uh, in the next slide. So this part is pretty simple, I believe, if you know OpenSys Pi. Uh, when you want to use such, a, such an approach and you want to use Python files, what you need to do is in the FEM or FEM part, uh, you need to select OpenSeas Pi instead of OpenSeas. And then you will have the option to provide three scripts, an input script, a post-process script, and the parameters file. This parameters file is something we don't have for uh, regular tickle scripts because in tickle, there is uh, this P set uh, way to define variables, and that's what we pick up. That's how we, we know uh, which parameters are uh, meant to be random in your analysis. For the Python case, we thought it's uh, uh, more flexible and versatile. If we have a uh, an external file that we just uh, import uh, in, the, in the input file later, let me show you how it works. So. We have this trust template Python file, and in line 10, you see that we are importing everything from the params file. And this is the params file. So it's just a list of parameters. This way, there's no need to do any PSET or anything like that. You just provide the list of parameters with their initial values, import them at the beginning, and then you can use them. You can see that we are using them right here. You can use them in the file. Uh, I think this, this is a nice way to separate the random variables from the Python script. So this will also make it easier for you to, to create good uh, code and, and model, it, model the randomness appropriately. So the input script would be this trust template pi and the parameters file is this params pi. 
what is this post-process script? I think we talked about that yesterday already with Frank, but just to revisit uh, why we have that script. Normally, you would have uh, the input script be responsible for running the analysis and preparing the model. So you see that we are pre preparing the model here and then performing the analysis here. If you know OpenSeas, even if you are only familiar with the tickle-based uh, scripts, I think you recognize these commands. And then in OpenSeas Pi, we don't really need the recorders. We can just record the response directly uh, after the analysis. You can see that here. And then we save the results to a file. That file is picked up in the post-process script. You can see that we are opening that file right here, reading the responses, and then uh, processing those responses and providing the results file for QuoFem. This is perfectly in line with what was happening yesterday with the Tickle-based script. Now, as you can imagine, it would be much more efficient not to save a file and then load a file, but keep everything in the memory and then do the, do the whole uh, process and the whole analysis within the same script. So we provide you this option, and it's actually quite easy to do this with Python. So you see that this is a script. We, we jumped to example two. It does the same thing as example one, but now we have everything the post-processing and the input in the trust template.py. So you can see that as we run the analysis, first we call this run analysis function, which is basically what used to be the first part of the input, which returns the displacements, but returns it within the same script. And then we feed that into the process results, and it processes the results. Note that these are all arbitrary function names. You can structure this script in any way you like. The only requirement is that it should provide a results.out file with the results in it. So we believe this gives you a lot of flexibility. Uh, you can do many kinds of analysis. As you will see, that you are not even limited to OpenSeasPy here. So let's see an example of how we use these files. We will do a forward propagation example with 100 samples. And in this case, if you open this, this file, you will see uh, I set up the random variables in a way to demonstrate uh, all the different distributions that we have. Of course, it's, it's easy to argue against uh, the initial stiffness having a viable distribution. So the point is not to be realistic here, just to demonstrate the capabilities of the tool. You see that these parameters were picked up from the params pi. You can remove them if you don't want to be, don't want to consider one of them random. And I think Frank also shown yesterday that uh, you, can, you can check the PDF of these distributions, which is maybe you, you think it's unnecessary for a normal distribution, but when you are defining a Weibull or a beta, this can come really handy. So, the last step before running the analysis is the quantities of interest. Again, this was, I believe, discussed yesterday, so I will touch upon it really quickly. In the post-process script, we have a part that parses these strings. So the reason you provide node to disp2 here, the way it's structured depends on how you define this part of your post-processing uh, script. You see that we are splitting these strings and taking the first and the third uh, element, uh, element. So two and two here. If we had a different function here, we could do different things and define different uh, outputs or retrieve different outputs uh, from the analysis. So please don't think that this is hard coded in there. This is quite flexible actually. And if you want, let's say, element to force uh, x, for example, then you would need to change this function to respond to that. But there is a, a possibility to do that, uh, depending on what kind of analysis you are doing. OK, so in this case, we are going to retrieve uh, vertical displacements from two nodes. And 
you know, run the analysis. And you can see that we get the same thing as yesterday. Statistics for the quantities of interest. So these four typical uh, moments. And then we also get every sample uh, for uh, the forward propagation. So now let me show you a quick demo of this. Um, just to show that it actually works. And also to highlight that with the examples, I also provided a way for you to load the settings immediately. So if you go to the, to the folder, you will see that there's an input JSON file. Let me, let me switch to all files just so you can see what's in there. So there are the three files for the first example. Let's just go to the second example. So you see there are two files. This one has the input and the post-processing part, and this one is the parameters file. And there's this third file. If you open this one, it could populate all the fields automatically, which will make your life much easier if you just want to test if this works. It should uh, populate it with the, these paths, with the right path according to what where you put these examples on your computer, but make sure you check it and, and verify that it actually did it the right way. Okay, so all of the examples that I'm showing today in the presentation have such an input file uh, corresponding to them so that you don't need to manually type in uh, every detail. So as I mentioned, we are running a forward propagation. I'm just gonna run 30 samples here to make it real fast. Uh, this is what we what we saw in the presentation. We don't have a post-process script, uh, a separate one. It's combined with the trust template. These are the distributions. So if you wanna see the beta, for example, you can see how it looks like and quantities of interest. And then I'm running the analysis. Should be pretty fast. Yes, we get the results and then we get the data values. So, and just to confirm, Although 30 samples is not a lot, so you might not believe me that this is a beta. Let's, let's make it 100. So, shouldn't take more than a few seconds, yes. And here we are. So this looks more like the beta from 20 to 30. All right, so this is how, how it works with uh, Python scripts. Let me jump back to the presentation and show you one more detail or one more option, which is to run something that has nothing to do with open seas. Because we are not calling open seas when we are running these uh, scripts. We are calling Python with the, with the script that you provide as the input script as an argument. So if you provide something that runs a MATLAB code or even abacus if you wish we can do that if, if you have abacus on your system and, and all that so if everything else that is required to run those scripts is available then there's no uh, obstacle to running those with quofem so this gives you a lot of flexibility in, in the types of problems that you can uh, solve with this tool and just to give you an example here I, I brought in a typical benchmark that is used for uncertainty quantification and optimization. This is a, the Rosenbrock function. You can see how it looks like here. It's actually quite uh, difficult to find the optimum in this valley. Uh, but what we are going to do now, because we are uh, reviewing forward propagation cases, we are going to look at uh, a sampling uh, within this space in a second. So the the input script, as you can see, in this case, has, not, has no finite element analysis in it. What it does is it just runs the function with the two parameters that are provided uh, through the params pi file. And this is this line 17 is uh, the Rosenbrock function. That's it. It's uh, example number three, if you are interested. So. Once we set this up and run it, I decided to run it in a way that I constrained y to be around one and a half. And this way, by running 
uh, uniform distribution of x between minus 2 and plus 2, we get back this nicely shaped uh, uh, part of the, of the function with the two valleys, as you can see there. So you can experiment with this, and uh, you will see in the end that the exercises, uh, I, will, I will ask you to try to run a calibration on this function and try to find uh, its minimum uh, using Quofem. It should be, you know, it's, it's, it uses the same script, just a different uh, uh, method at the beginning in the UQ part. So uh, let's move on to the calibration examples. In this case, we will shift to a different example that we got from Professor Joel Conti from uh, UCSD. This is a, an example that he prepared for Bayesian calibration. And uh, we are going to use it to demonstrate both the optimization, so conventional calibration, as I call it, and the Bayesian calibration in this presentation. So this example is a two-story uh, uh, moment frame. It uses a, uses a 2D version of the moment frame. And uh, it has several constraints. So in the end, you can see the rollers here. In the end, we are looking at the two degrees of freedom structure where the two stories can move horizontally, and that's it, just to make it simpler and educational. Uh, so we have two DOF, and we will have two unknowns, as you will see. We know the masses, and we know the geometry, so we know the height, and we know the size of the bay. What we don't know uh, is the stiffness, or more specifically, the inertia of the columns. And we assume that we have done five experiments to characterize the vibration of this frame. We measured uh, the first mode uh, period and the shape. And we are going to use those five experiments to try to estimate the stiffness of the columns on the first and the second floors. So you see that we have five lambda values and five phi values. These phi values correspond to the normalized. So correspond to the mode shape, no, the displacement on the second floor uh, in the first mode uh, vibration when it's normalized by the displacement on the first floor. So it's, it's the relative between the first and the second floors. We will use these five experiments uh, in the following calibration problems. One thing to note here that is important is when we measure these data, we assume that we have some error in the measurements. Because in reality, we always do. In this case, uh, Professor Conti used 5% error to create these data. So he put noise on the true response that he got from a synthetic model. And this error, as you will see, will make it very difficult to do a good job with the conventional calibration, because we will not be able to find a single point that would give us a very good match with all of these data. And that's where the Bayesian calibration will come in and will give us a more uh, informed understanding of, of the uncertainty in the uh, uh, stiffnesses of the columns. So let's start with uh, seeing what kind of files we need and how, what kind of scripts you would need to prepare to tackle such a problem. I would like to go this way because I think this is the natural way you would progress from having an experimental result or some kind of measured data and then using QOFM to use that data to, to calibrate uh, uh, a model that you have. So you can substitute this experiment with an experiment that you are doing in the lab. And I am almost certain that you can find a way to use QOFM to calibrate uh, a numerical model to that experiment. So in this case, as I mentioned, we have five measurements. So we will, we will use tickle uh, based open seas because our exper experience is that some users have trouble running open seas pi on a Mac. And uh, I wanted to make sure that everybody can uh, do these examples uh, on your local machine. So that's why I chose tickle. So you see, we have uh, a tickle file prepared. This is going to be a file with post-processing and 
the modeling part uh, combined in it. And it starts with the measured data. We have five measurements. This is just the data that we had from uh, Professor Conti. And then these sigma values I'm going to explain a little bit later when we get to the quantities of interest. Then we had parameters in the model, and you can see that two of them are going to be random. These are uh, assigned the P set labels at the beginning. And you see that those uh, inertia values are used when the columns are defined. So those are indeed uh, the properties of the columns. Other than that, as you can see, this is a pretty basic uh, tickle script for a two-story frame structure. And this is the end of the script. This is where it gets interesting. So we run a modal analysis to get the eigenvalues and also to get the eigenvector and calculate uh, the, uh, the displacement of the second floor. That's going to be the phi value, and the lambda is the first eigenvalue. And then we calculate the errors between the, these simulated values and the measurements. And we normalize them by these sigma values. Again, I'm going to explain that a little bit later. And then provide all of those errors. So this is going to be 10 errors in the output file. Now, this is how the output file looks like. You can see that we have 10 values in there. This is a single line. It's just wrapped so that you can see it in a single slide. It's important to have a lot of digits here so that we can see even small changes in the numbers when, when we do the optimization. Not B, but Dakota to be, to be exact. OK, so we have these 10 pieces of data, and we are going to use that to find uh, the optimal stiffnesses. Now let's see how we do that in QuoFem. Optimization in QuoFem is called parameters estimation. This is what you can also call conventional calibration when you have an objective function and you are trying to find the minimum. I recommend using the NL2Sol method. This is a nonlinear least squares method from Dakota. You can set uh, standard uh, parameters here, number of iterations and the, the convergence tolerance. Usually you wanna, wanna have a small tolerance, especially when you have multiple uh, error values we use 10 now. So 1e minus 10 is not extreme here. And then in the second uh, input uh, panel, we provide the input script. We don't need a post-process script because uh, this one has the post-process included in it. And then this is where it gets different from the forward propagation problems and the other problems that Frank has shown you yesterday. Because in the RV part, we are not providing random variables, but we are providing the constraints for the optimization. We have two variables of interest, the two stiffnesses of the columns. And then we need to provide a lower bound and the upper bound for each. It doesn't have to be the same. I was just uh, using the same because that's how the example is uh, set up. And the initial points uh, are also important. So you provide the range of values and the initial points where we start the optimization from. And when we get to the quantities of interest, you can see that we have 10 values here because we calculated 10 different error values in the script. Now, these values are going to be minimized if with the NL2 SOL algorithm in Dakota, it takes the uh, minimizes the, the sum of squared errors. So it squares these and it tries to minimize the sum of them. This is why it's important to make sure that they are in the same range or they are scaled properly, because otherwise, if the say the lambda values are much larger, the absolute value, then the phi values, then these are gonna control the optimization. So that's why I divided by the standard deviation that we estimated for those based on the measurement error that is assumed to be known. So we know that our measurements have 5% error, and then 
that way we can normalize the errors in the lambda and in the phi values to be uh, well we will assume that they are standard normal so zero is means no error and then be normalized by the standard deviation it's also important to note i have this note here for that reason that although we, we now output all 10 values you could change the script and say calculate the sum of squared errors within the script and only provide that single value as an output and then you would have only one quantity of interest here and you wouldn't see how these individually change uh, it's up to you or you can decide that you want to uh, combine these 10 values in a different way you could do that in the script provide a single output and then the quota would minimize that all right so if we run this optimization what we get uh, is a summary where you see the best parameter which is uh, the result with the smallest uh, error in this case this is a quite good considering that we have noise in the measurement data you can see that the true value is 1190 and these are quite close we also have a general tab i apologize for the resolution of this one where you can see uh, the residuals for the 10 error values and what we can see here i hope you can you can see that is that these residuals are quite large some of them are uh, on the order of 1 to 10 so that means we are oftentimes more than one standard deviation away from the ideal value considering the measurement errors that we have and this already suggests that although this optimization uh, uh, method provided us an answer that answer is not a perfect answer it's not not it doesn't have a small error so we probably have quite some uncertainty about this result if you look at the data values you can see individual samples so you can see how we got to the final result we started from here uh, ic2 so that's the second story column was 500 and ic1 was uh, 1500 and then first we decreased the size of the second of the first story column and then we increased the size of the second story column to arrive at the results that were that are shown in the summary this allows you to to trace uh, how these values were optimized and you can save the data if you wish if this is especially needed if you have say a thousand steps to reach your uh, final result you might uh, need an external tool to uh, post process or visualize them more efficiently all right so as i mentioned we might want to see the uncertainty in these stiffnesses in these column stiffnesses and to do that uh, we can use the bayesian approach where we try to estimate the posterior distribution of these uh, stiffnesses based on an initial prior distribution so we make an assumption about the uncertainty in these uh, column stiffnesses and then using the data as evidence we are updating that prior distribution and arrive at a posterior distribution that combines the data and our prior belief about those stiffnesses i will show you how to do this in uh, quofem we are using the dream method from dakota there is a publication here in the slide that you can take a look at this is a markov chain monte carlo uh, based method that uses multiple chains and runs multiple chains to uh, get a better idea in a in to to make sure that you capture uh, the parameters properly if you have a multi-dimensional space this is often needed so that you don't get stuck in a local optimum and uh, in our case you know this is a simple problem this is just two-dimensional so it doesn't have a huge advantage but when you are looking at 10 dimensional problems or higher this will really help you uh, find a good solution efficiently so the number of chains here uh, i recommend you to use the number of chains 
equal to the number of processors you have unless you have less than four because this has a minimum of three but if you have four cores i recommend you to use four chains the samples here is the total samples across all chains so it's going to be divided this is going to be divided by the number of chains and that's how many samples you will have for a single mcmc now you might say that this is a small number it's a small number indeed but this will help us do these examples in a reasonable amount of time uh, normally you would want to use at least about a thousand samples per chain to get uh, robust results oftentimes it's much more than that depends on the dimensionality of the problem burning is important for marco chain monte carlo usually you want to burn about 10 to 25 percent of the samples here we burn 20, the first 25 percent and only work on the uh, remaining samples and the jump step allows this method to take a larger step during the walk uh, in the Markov chain and this way get out of again local uh, extrema. If you read the publication you will have a better understanding of how this works. There are some other settings. If you're interested in using those settings let us know and we are happy to expose them here but we wanted to keep this simple first and see uh, how it works for you and uh, if you find it useful. All right, yeah, oh, I didn't say the random seed, of course, allows you to run the same analysis, even though it's, it's a random analysis because the, the numbers are pseudo random. You can basically get the same random numbers multiple times by providing the same seed. Okay, so, in case of a Bayesian, the, the FVM is the same. You, you provide the same input uh, script for the truss, for the frame. And uh, for the random variable part, what you provide here is the prior distribution of the variables. In this example, we want to say that we don't really know what the stiffness of the columns is. So we provide a uniform distribution we provide limits that we consider reasonable, but nothing more than that. If you have a better idea, say if you want to guess, uh, want to estimate uh, a material property, let's say the yield strength of steel, usually you have a pretty good idea about where it is. So you might not want to have a uniform distribution, but you will have a normal distribution or a log normal distribution here. All of the distributions that I've shown in the earlier slides that are available for forward propagation are available here also as a prior distributions. So you set these up and then the quantities of interest uh, look very similar to conventional calibration, but uh, they are used a little differently because these values are uh, going to be used to determine the likelihood of observing the experimental data from the five experiments given the model parameters that uh, we use so given the two stiffnesses that are sampled for a given uh, realization of this frame we determine the likelihood of observing those five experiments that we have observed earlier and this is where it's important to remember that dakota uses a standard normal distribution to calculate these likelihoods and that's why it's very important to standardize the errors by the standard deviations that you expect them to have. So here in the file, you remember that we divided the errors with sigma phi and sigma lambda that were calculated based on the information that we have a 5% error in our measurements. This is how I standardize them. And for example, in this results output, you can see that we have a much smaller error in the lambda values than in the phi values in this particular case. All right. When you run the analysis, you will get a summary that provides a mean and the standard deviation of the posterior distribution marginals. So it's the marginal for uh, the stiffness at the first floor the stiffness at the second floor 
And you will also get to see the whole chain for, in this case, it's the second floor. And of course, if you change it, you can see it for the first floor. And you can also see individual errors uh, and how they progressed over the analysis. This is an analysis with 800 samples. If you want, you can use the left and right clicking uh, uh, approach to get a histogram or to get a CDF for a marginal distribution. So in this case, again, it's the second floor stiffness. You can see that it's kind of a bell curve, but it's not really uh, a perfectly normal distribution. We have a longer tail here. And we can also plot the joint distribution of the two variables where you can observe their range. And if we go back to here, you can already see an important result here that the first floor stiffness is much more certain than the second floor stiffness based on the experimental data that we have. This is what you can get, or this is the kinds of information that you can get with this Bayesian calibration that is not available with a regular uh, minimization of an objective function. Okay, so let me show you how this works. Again, you can open an input file that, let's just go here. It's in the 2D moment frame. The param est is a parameter estimation and the Bayesian is the Bayesian calibration case. It uses the same input for the uh, open C's part. So let's open the Bayesian case. You see that it's set up exactly the same way. I'm going to reduce the number of samples because I don't want to spend a lot of time with this. It doesn't run for a very long time, so don't be afraid to run for 400. It takes a couple of minutes. I just want to be careful with time here. Uh, this is surprising. It should be there, but that's why you should check it. So if it's not there, you need to put the, the script here. Yes, the random variables are there, uniform distribution, as I've shown in the slides. We have the 10 outputs, and then we can run the Bayesian calibration. And it should take just a few seconds with a small number of samples. Yeah. Oh, somebody drew something there. Yeah. So. You see these results and, and you also see that if we don't have a sufficiently large number of samples, the standard deviations look very different. So make sure you run enough samples because now if I show you how this looks like, this is the, the chain as we see it and this doesn't really give us a lot of information. So we need more data. So when you, when you run it on your local machine, make sure you run it at at least until 400, but if you have time, run it until 4,000. You can save this data just like you can save the uh, other data with, with other methods, and then you can post-process it and uh, you know, use, it, use it in your tool of choice, MATLAB or Excel or Python or Jupyter. Now, the last thing I would like to show you, it's part of the presentation, but I, I'm not going to use the slides now. Those slides are going to help you when you try to do this yourself. If you want to run the same thing on a design safe, how would you do that? First, you need to log in by clicking at the top right corner to this login button. Uh, when you provide your username and password for the first time, it is going to be stored and remembered for later, so you don't need to put it in every time. So I can log in just like that. If you don't have a Design Safe account, you can go to the Design Safe CI website and register there uh, quite easily, and it's free. Then, once you have logged in, you need to prepare the analysis just like you do for a local run. So it's the same inputs. I didn't change anything, but instead of clicking on Run, you click on Run at Design Safe. You give it a name. I'm going to say Bayesian test two. 
and make sure you set up the runtime appropriately. So if you're running something that takes about two minutes at your local computer, give it about the same time or maybe twice as much on design state. Some of the problems can be parallelized. If, if that's the case, then the runtime might be shorter. Some other problems, for example, an optimization problem oftentimes is not parallelizable. So it's going to run in a serial mode there and you don't, you cannot expect it to be much faster. What you win by running it at design safe is that it's not running it on your computer. So say you can run it overnight there and you can do something else yourself. So be careful with this time. If you set it too short, your analysis is going to fail because it runs out of time. If you set it too long, then you are going to sit in the queue and wait uh, for your turn to run things. So don't put 100 hours here. 20 minutes will be fine for this case. We are not going to wait for that to, to complete. You, set, you say submit, and you can see the messages here that the file is prepared, successfully uploaded, and that's it. Then you can do whatever you want. You can even uh, close the application. You don't have to be here for this analysis to run because it's running remotely. As when you feel like it should be completed, you check how it is doing it with the get from design save button. You click on that and you can see all the jobs that I have ran in the past. And this last one here, or this first one, is the one that we are trying to run now. If you click on the name, you can refresh the job or retrieve the data if it's completed. So by refreshing it, you can see how it is. It's queued now. It will probably start running in a few seconds or perhaps minutes. This is something I ran just recently. So I'm going to show you how, it, how to retrieve the data once this shows finished. You click on the job and you say retrieve data. And then, as you can see up here with the messages, we are automatically connecting to design safe, pulling in the data files, and then display it to you here in the same way as it is displayed when you run it on your own computer. So it's the same kinds of outputs and you can see a chain here and you can save the data uh, just like you do when you run it locally. All right, so that's about what I wanted to show you. Here are the slides for the, uh, for the remote runs so you can review what I have just shown and then I have a couple of exercises that will help you check if you really developed an understanding of how these uh, Python scripts and uh, the calibration uh, functions or calibration part of the QoFem tool work. Please take a look at these and uh, I look forward to discussing your solutions or uh, obstacles or perhaps bugs that you ran into while trying to solve them uh, during the office hours. I believe we still have a few minutes for questions and answers, but I will let Matt decide that. And thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Adam. That was, that was, very, that was great. Uh, we do have some questions and we have a few minutes left in this hour to, uh, to relay those. Um, I'm going to uh, I'm going to throw these at you. Um, the first one sure. um, is going to be a feature request. So this is easy because you don't have to answer at all. Uh, <laughs> what I'm going to ask is that the, if uh, any of you have a feature request, that you go to the Sim Center user forum and submit that feature request uh, to the user forum so it can be triaged appropriately. And the feature request uh, that was submitted is 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 it possible to have a progress tab? This would show what has already been run, uh, how many samples or param what their parameters were so that uh, people have an understanding of, of uh, how much longer they have to wait. So um, again, just a reminder, feature requests like this, please put those into the user forum. Can, um, I, can I give a short response to this? Just uh, of course. Because if, the, if this person puts it on the forum, maybe, maybe they can elaborate a bit. So, uh, I'm interested in if, if this is for local or remote runs. For remote runs, it's much harder to provide such a progress bar, so I'm, I'm not sure we can do that. For local runs, I'm, I'm pretty sure we can do something about this. So please let us know if you are interested in the remote or the local uh, case. Mm -hmm. Good point. 
Um, a lot of the examples that were shown were structural problems. And uh, is QuoFem intended for or optimized for structural problems? Or is it more of a general use uh, finite element uh, method application? I would say that it's, it's, it's even more general than that, especially, you know, I'm not doing justice to, to, to Tickle by saying that Python allows you to do this because Tickle also allows you to do this. So if, we, if you have a script that has a problem in it and provides a results.out, it will work with Chrome. I'm showing structural examples because I'm a structural engineer, so I'm more comfortable with them. But if you say, if you're a geotechnical engineer, you can definitely use it for geotechnical problems. And if you are another type of engineer, perhaps not even a civil engineer, you can definitely still use it as long as you can put your problem in a script or call it with a Python script. The Python script could be just a wrapper around your application that, that deals with the problem. I hope that helps. Yeah. And then uh, this question came in before you actually started showing the Bayesian updating, um, which is how to deal with uncertainty in experiments and how do you combine this uncertainty uh, with that of the finite element model? Um, yeah, so and so I think that that question may be answered by the demonstration that you gave, but if you wanted to elaborate on that at all, please feel free. I, 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 hope, I hope it was, but uh, just one caveat about this Bayesian updating. Uh, one important detail here was that we knew the error in the measurements. If you don't know the error, then describing that likelihood function is much more difficult. But that's just a general issue with Bayesian updating. It's not a problem with QuoFem. So I think what we provide is, is a good starting point for sure. And then, and then you will see where you can get from there. And let us know if you need additional features that, that are not available at the moment. Mm -hmm. Um, the next question is, can QuoFem be used for calibration only when the periods and or mode shapes are, are available? Or does it also work with known or measured responses in terms of a time series, for example, story accelerations? So it's definitely not limited to mode shapes. It can be, this, this, this example is just, what it, it's just an example, it's just, uh, showing you some data that is measured and that is also produced by a simulation and then shows you how to use the measured data to get an understanding of the uncertainty of in some of the parameters. Actually, one of the, one of the exercises that I have for you is to change what we are calibrating. Uh, we are not changing the measurements, but we are changing instead of calibrating the inertia, we can calibrate the story heights and the initial uh, stiffnesses. And it's just that easy. So if you have another uh, experiment where you have, say, a time history, as you mentioned, you can probably use it. But the problem with the time history is that these uh, types of calibrations assume that those experimental data are uh, independent and identically distributed. And your time history data is not going to be independent. So you will have to deal with that somehow. But if you are interested in how to do that, come to the office hours and we can talk about it. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, and the next question might be for an example that was shown yesterday. Um, but uh, I'll see if you can field it. What is yeah. the minimum number of samples uh, for an example with five random variables to have reasonable results? And a follow-up question is, is, if the finite element model takes a long time to, to run, what can be done to improve or reduce these numbers of samples? So, OK, so I will start with the second one. Mm -hmm. uh, if the finite element model takes a long time to run, then many people turn to surrogate modeling these days. And we are also pursuing that. We, we are working on including surrogate models. Actually, we already have surrogate models that are available from Dakota, but we would like to make it easier to use and more transparent in, in what those models provide so that you can take the surrogate models themselves and not just 
the results that you get with the surrogates, if you, if you know what I mean with this. So anyway, the point is that we are working on surrogate solutions and they are going to be available soon in COFIM. I don't want to promise September, but my personal expectation is September. And uh, yeah, so those, those will provide you a way to really quickly sample the, the response surface if that surface is sufficiently simple. And in many cases it is. So, so for finite element models that take a long time to run, this could be a solution. About the first question, how many samples you need for reasonable results, that depends on what you consider reasonable and what is the distribution of the output. Uh, depending on the distribution, you can usually come up with uh, estimates of the uncertainty in the statistics such as the mean or the standard deviation of the output. And then you will see how many samples you need to get uh, reasonable results. As a rule of thumb, you definitely, with five variables, you definitely need hundreds of samples. So you cannot get away with 10. If, if, I, don't, I don't know if that helps, but it really depends on your needs. So, so it's hard to answer this question without knowing more about the problem you are facing. Well, thank you, Adam, for answering these questions. Uh, additional questions, I'm going to encourage people to um, relay in the user forum uh, or come to the office hours uh, later this afternoon. Um, Adam, thank you very much uh, for this introduction to QuoFem. Uh, to the audience, thank you for participating. And uh, this concludes uh, today's uh, webinar introducing uh, QuoFem.